All right, welcome to Full Momentum and HEC RAS Vodcast. I'm your host, Ben Carey, and joining me as always here today is Chris Goodell. Chris, welcome to episode five of Full Momentum. Hey, Ben, how you doing? Good to see you. Happy Thursday to you. Happy Thursday to you. Yeah, I'm doing good. We, uh, we're enjoying a, a pretty nice spell of nice weather, 80 plus degrees here in the Pacific Northwest. So I know uh, <sighs> I, I and my wife and my dog are enjoying that. Um, are you? I'm not used to it yet. It's a little too hot in the house. I'm going to have to turn on the AC, which I try not to do, but uh, it may happen this week. Yeah. We'll yeah, see. I know. It, <laughs> nice for hydraulic modelers when the weather's nice so we can get outside a little bit because we tend to spend a little bit probably too much time on uh on computer software so <laughs> yep yep exactly yeah you got to get outside you can't stare at your screen all day long or you'll go crazy especially doing ras modeling right yep yeah and i know this week chris and i have been uh teaching our first online 1d 2d uh heck ras class which has been great um, but that means we've been spending even um, maybe a little bit more time inside than we would like. Uh, but the class has been really great. Um, really excited. Hopefully there are some people tuning into this episode today that are taking that class and uh, have been enjoying it as well. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think uh, it, it has gone so smooth. And I think people are used to doing um, webinars now. They're used to doing stuff online with their video equipment and, and audio equipment. And I was just blown away at how smooth the very first one went. In fact, uh, I don't know if you thought the same thing, Ben, but um, it's people are understanding how to do this now. It's becoming part of their daily lives. So, yeah, I, I was, I've been pleasant. Right? <laughs> yeah, good for us. And I've been ple I was pleasantly surprised as well with how smooth things have gone. And uh, just a reminder to everybody who enjoys listening to these short vodcasts that if you really feel like you're getting a lot out of these discussions. Chris and I are just barely scratching the surface on the amount of content that we cover in our 1D, 2D class. Um, this is meant to be, uh, obviously, we give you guys a lot of, of information, tips and tricks on different special topics. But if you really want to take your RAS knowledge to the next level, um, watching these podcasts might not be enough for you. So we'd encourage you keep keep an eye on uh, either of our LinkedIn pages or, or Kleinschmidt's LinkedIn page for the announcement for the next online class that we do and sign up. You'll get a lot from it. Um, I know uh, everybody that's taking the class right now has been really encouraged with how that's gone. So, yeah, I agree. And keep your eye on the RAS solution too. Um, Absolutely. You'll see all the news, the latest there. So cool. Very so good. what are we going to talk about today, Ben? Yeah, we got a really special topic today, Chris. So we're going to bypass a lot of the, or I should say some of our common segments like tips and tricks and uh, a current kind of hydrologic modeling story, um, even though there are a lot of cool, or I should say really just more interesting hyd hydraulic engineering stories going on right now in the world. Um, and we're going to bypass that and we're going to really focus on RAS Mapper. We're going to focus on today, the construction of 1D and 2D elements within RAS Mapper and how that's done in a step-by-step -step basis. Um, we will have a second uh, RAS Mapper tutorial video that comes out at, at a later date that will cover how to view and extract results within RAS Mapper, which I think that will be really helpful to folks as well. But today we're really gonna focus on the construction of 1D and 2D elements, how to do it, um, some tips and tricks that we've learned uh, through our many years of working with it within RAS Mapper. Um, so we're really excited about that. Before we jump in all the way, though, I would like to do a, a quick read for our sponsor. Again, uh, for those of you guys who aren't aware, Chris and I both work for Kleinschmidt Associates, and uh, we're very happy that they've chosen to support this venture. And so I just would like to give them a shout out. Um, we're very thankful to Kleinschmidt. Um, Kleinschmidt is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at Kleinschmidt Group. Dot com. So again, thank you to Kleinschmidt. And with that, let's uh, let's dive into RAS Mapper. So for those of you guys who are uh, viewing this podcast, you'll see a RAS Mapper screen here on the right. And I'll actually let Chris go ahead and take over and share his screen um, so he can talk about uh, some things. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'm going to talk about RAS Mapper and the, the purpose of this podcast really is to go through the pre-processing side of things. So we're going to focus on that. But the first thing I want to do here is introduce you to RAS Mapper itself. Some of you may not be familiar with it, uh, haven't used it yet, or maybe haven't used it very much. And it is quite a bit different than the rest of HEC RAS and, and the other windows we're used to. So I'm just going to go through and quickly introduce 
the uh, the general layout of RAS Mapper and uh, the different features inside of it. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Ben to go into a little bit more detail on how to pre-process the geometry. So the first time you open up RAS Mapper, you'll notice um, a blank screen, unless you've got some geometry in there already. But generally, the first time you'll have a blank screen. And you'll notice over here on the left hand side, we have the layer manager. And this is kind of a tree file format. So it's really easy to navigate down to all the different elements of your geometry or the different results that you want to see. Here you can see we've got map layers as well. This is kind of a general location for different types of map layers that you can bring in. And we've got our terrain group here as well. And this is where all your terrains are stored and where you create them. But let's start up here at the top. We've got our typical file uh, menu items, like the file one, open, save, and exit. We've got our tools. And this is probably where you'll spend most of your time in the tools area. And you can see some of the different features in here. I encourage you guys to explore the options in there so you get a feel for what options are available to you. But the very first thing that you want to do when you get into RAS Mapper with a new project is set your projection. And so there's a reason why it's up at the top here. It's because it's usually the first thing you do. By setting your projection, you're able to then have all of your layers line up properly. And they each layer could have its own projection, but it's going to be reprojected to the projection you, you select here. So you just click on it. It brings you to this. This is actually the options window, but really all you need to do is click on this file open button, and that's going to take you to a Windows Explorer, where then you can go find your projection file. And you can see here, my projection has, file has a, a useful name. It looks like a projection file, but it ends in PRJ. And that's what all projection files end in. So make sure you've got that PRJ uh, extension, but don't confuse that with your RAS project file, which also has a PRJ extension. That will not work here. It needs to be a valid projection file. And you'll know it's valid because you'll have some information here that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so once you've got your projection, go ahead and click OK. You've got a projection established. That opens the door to add in web imagery. And that's one of the really cool things about having your projection is now we can go into map layers and I can right click on that and say add web imagery. And this will allow me to access uh, a number of different online web imagery sources. Probably the most popular one that's used is Google Satellite. Bing Satellite also works very well. You may want to have Google Maps on there um, also. I usually don't use much of these ArcGIS layers, but they're available as well. And all you need is a projection file, which we've already established, and an internet connection. And then you're ready to pull satellite data or other kinds of imagery right off of the web. I've already done that. And so I'll turn that on by checking the box here. And there's our aerial imagery. You can zoom in and zoom out. And it's going to automatically download the, the best imagery for whatever zoom level you're at. So it's constantly refreshing and resampling to give you the best imagery possible as you zoom in and out. All right, so now we've got our projection and our imagery. The next thing you want to do is get in your terrain. Okay, The terrain is required if you're going to do 2D pre-processing. Or if you're going to do, um, well, actually in 1D pre-processing as well, or if you're going to map. So it's really an essential part of RAS Mappers having your terrain. Now, you don't technically have to have a terrain to put together a HECRAS model, uh, a 1D model. If you are doing a 2D model, you do need to have a terrain. But to add a terrain, you just right-click on it and say create a new RAS terrain. And we get our new terrain new terrain layer editor, where you can then add in your um, elevation data sets that you wish to bring in. You do that just by clicking this plus button right here. And when you do that, you have to search for a raster type terrain. These are geotiffs, and they work great. You can also use Esri grids. You can use um, floating point files, FLTs. And according to the manuals, pretty much any raster-based 
elevation data set will work here, but those are the three most popular ones used for RAS. I've already brought one in, so I'm not going to go ahead and do that. But once you have this filled out, and you can bring in multiple elevation data sets, in, in fact, you just order them in the priority you wish to have as they're merged together. But once you've got those in there, give it a name, click the, the open button, and that'll allow you to rename it to something more useful. So maybe you put in um, existing topography and put today's date on it. Um, so I'll go 2020 underscore 05. What's the date? 28, I think. Click save, and then you're going to have a new name there that means a lot more than just the, uh, the default terrain name. Um, usually the rounding precision, the default value is very good. So I usually don't change that, but you can change that if you wish in here. And I, I suggest we keep the create stitches option turned on because if you do bring in multiple data sets, then RAS will use this tin stitch feature that it has built in to blend those together in a much more seamless way than if you didn't have create stitches on. So once you're done, you just press the create button and um, that will make your terrain. I've already done it, so I'm not gonna hit create, but I'll show you what I've got here by turning this on. Now I won't see it right now because it's hidden behind Google Satellite. So I'll turn that off so you can see my terrain. And there's my terrain. And you know you have a really good projection or a valid projection when your terrain and your aerial imagery or your uh, web-based imagery line up. So I can double check that. Here you can see clearly see a dam. And if I turn on the imagery, the crest of the dam is in the exact same place as it is in the terrain. So I know I have a really good projection established there. So once you've got that, you're ready to pre-process, but before I turn it back over to Ben, I wanna just highlight some of the buttons up at the top. These are some uh, shortcut buttons available to you, some navigation buttons. The first group right here is all about your display. So you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can zoom to extents like this. This is the pan button. So if I click on that, I can just click and move around like that. This is the select button over here. And then we've got uh, zoom to previous. Uh, you can go either direction if you want. And then this measuring tool, which is really cool. Uh, this measuring tool will allow you to measure any of the active layers over here. And you know it's active when it's highlighted. Right now, the, the terrain group is highlighted, but if I wanted to actually measure on this specific terrain, I would need to highlight it by click, clicking on the label first, turning it to that magenta color, and now I can measure on this. And I can just click a series of points, make a line out of it, double click to end it, and it's gonna tell me the length of that line, the average slope of that line, you can even save it as a profile line if you wish to do that or copy the coordinates, which is a very useful um, option as well. Or if you just wanna look at it, go ahead and plot the terrain. And here you can see I've plotted the terrain and we've got a high ground feature right here, which looks to be where I went a little bit outside of the floodplain onto the high area. So this shows you the terrain uh, as well. And you can get a table too, which you can copy paste into Excel if you'd like to do that. Then further on um, along the list of buttons or the, or the row of buttons here, we've got some of our velocity visualization tools, the vectors and particle tracing. These are the settings for how you uh, control how those velocity visualization tools look. And then we've got um, our uh, options for changing the render mode. So if we wanna change the render mode, how it's actually displaying results, we can do that. Not gonna get into that right now. And then finally, we've got the animation control over here. So this is our animation toolbar. We can do a quick select of the max or min values. Um, we have control over the speed of the animation toolbar right here with this little turtle. And then um, a play button right there. And then finally, last thing I wanna highlight is the bottom left where we've got uh, a few different tabs here that you can look at. We've got just messages. So RAS will give you some messages as you do things in RAS Mapper. It will update and tell you what's going on. It'll tell you if you got some errors. 
The views is really cool because this allows you to save different views. So let's say I'm zooming in to this dam quite a bit. And I want to come back to this a lot and not have to go through the buttons up here. Just do it a quick way. I can save this as a view by clicking the plus button. Give it a name. I'll just name this dam. Okay. And now I've got a view saved right here. And if I zoom out like that, I can double click on this and it's going to take me right back anytime I want. So that's a really nice feature. Mm -hmm. And then the profile lines allow you to extract results onto a linear feature. So a polyline. So I can just click this plus button and I can draw a line where I might be interested in results here. I've got a longitudinal line or a profile line. Okay, I'll save that and it's going to ask me for a name. I'll just call this stream center line one. Okay, now I've got a stream center line. If I go back up to the results, again, we're not going to get into the results too much, but I just want to demonstrate this really quick. And I pull on, let's say, water surface elevation. I can right click on this and I can plot that profile right on that line. So this shows me the line as well as the results if I were to uh, to have the results turned on. In this case, I don't have the results at the moment because I've got to rerun it, but um, you'll see a water surface profile on here as well. All right, so what do you think, Ben? Did I miss yeah, anything? Was, no, you did a great job of covering that. And I just want to uh, add to everybody uh, again that We'll be doing a whole nother um, podcast on viewing results, which will cover a lot of great stuff. And I also just want to reemphasize something that Chris said. And, you know, obviously he mentioned bringing in the projection file before you bring in your terrain and aerial imagery. And, and that's such a huge part of this process, because if you if you don't establish that, there's nothing that requires you to establish your projection first. You're actually able to bring in a terrain if you don't have a projection established, but you just have no way of verifying whether it's in the correct place or not. So it's so important to always add a projection file and then add aerial imagery and then your terrain so you can verify that everything's lining up. Uh, I've had many experiences over the last few months where the, you bring a train in and it doesn't line up. And so you have to go into troubleshooting mode at that point and figure out what needs to be changed um, before you start building your model. Because the last thing you want to do is construct a whole 1D or 2D model and they realize that it's not in the right place or that it's not in the right projection. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to start that all over again. So. And it really limits what you can do. If you don't have a projection file, you can't bring in uh, aerial imagery or web based imagery. You can't bring in other map layers that you might want to bring in. Maybe you want to bring in um, the uh, land classification data set that's in a different projection. It won't work unless you've got this projection established. So it's a very important part of it. Yeah, absolutely. The, la the last thing I would add too is um, you're in, under the map layers menu, and Chris, I can't remember if you, if you covered this or not, you're able to bring in or add um, shape files, uh, which can yep. be really helpful um, to either if you have a shapefile from an existing project that you want to bring in just as a reference, or if you actually want to bring that, that shapefile in or create a shapefile so that you can draw in certain features that you can actually copy into some of your geometry. Um, so that's another uh, really cool thing about the map layers menu that is, is, uh, is really helpful and something that we use quite often. Yeah, and just about all of the layers that you see over here are editable. Mm -hmm. editable <laughs> so that means you can copy features like like ben said you know just copy the features and paste it in another layer and it makes it really easy to to uh, move data around that way so good point absolutely all right i'm going to turn it back over to ben and now he's going to talk about pre-processing in ras mapper so once you have your terrain set up the way you want to and you know it's in the correct correct spatial location you're going to start building your geometry data so I'm going to show you guys how to do uh, build a 1D uh, reach as river reach as well as a 2D area. How to do that, and then some some different uh, things to know when you, when you're building that out. So what I'm going to start with today is is building just a 1D river reach. So we're going to start with again under geometries. When you guys first open up RASMapper, these will be completely blank. You won't have any geometries results because you haven't started your project yet. So the first thing you'll need to do is you'll need to go to geometries add new geometry, you'll give that geometry a name. And for instance, I did that today and I called it demo draw and then you'll end up with something that looks like this. Okay. 
Now inside of your geometry, you have the options to add rivers, cross sections, storage areas, 2D areas. And then you have the option to view structures. The one downside, or I should say the one thing you still have to use the geometric data editor for is to add structures. That's still the best way to do that, add and edit structures. So in RASMapper, that's usually, um, you only turn on structures if you wanna view where your different structure components are at. You can also view the uh, Manning's values that is that are associated with this geometry, as well as create some override regions, which again, like Chris said, we'll talk about that in another podcast. Um, and then lastly, you can add boundary condition lines to your geometry as well. So first, we're going to start with the rivers um, itself. That's usually the first thing you start with with a 1D model. So in this case, I'm going to expand the rivers. I can uh, I'm going to go ahead and edit the rivers. And the way you do that is right click on the on rivers, edit the geometry. And then you're going to get these edit tools up in the upper left hand corner. Uh, the first tool is to draw a new feature. The second tool is to edit a feature or move the points along a line. You can undo or redo uh, commands that you've made. Uh, this is plots the terrain profile of a currently selected cross section. And then you have your tool menu here. There's a lot of cool things to do um, that you can use these tool menus for. Um, we're not going to get into that today, but you'll learn that this is a really nice feature as well. So when you, when you go to edit the rivers, again, we're going to want to draw a new river because currently we don't have anything in here. And one thing I always like to do when you're going to draw geometry data is you're going to want to make sure that your terrain data, um, the visual effects of your terrain data is updating at every viewpoint that you currently um, have. So right now, if we go to the Bald Eagle Creek terrain and I go to image display properties, this displays uh, a lot of information about this terrain. And the important thing I'm going to focus on right now is this, this checkbox here, update per screen. So I always check this on. And the reason is, is if you have that on, as you zoom in, the terrain will actually update um, based on the highest and lowest elevation that's displayed in my screen. So this is really helpful when, for say, if you zoom into the river here and you want to get a good idea of where the high and low locations are at, this will automatically update on the fly as you're zooming in and out. So I always check yeah, that first. Notice the, uh, the scaling changes as you zoom in and out too. Yep, so you'll notice the yeah. scale bar over here changes. So right now a high of 271, and then if we zoom into the river here, that's gonna drop down to it looks like 180. So yeah, really, really handy useful. tool, especially yep. as we get into drawing cross sections and break lines. So I'm gonna start with just a river reach here. So I'm gonna start just downstream of the dam and I'm gonna just draw a few points here. I'm just using the left clicker to uh, click these points. If at any point you double click, that will end your river reach. I'm just going to draw just a few more points here so we can get some good cross sections in. And then I'm going to double click and that ends my river reach. So now it's going to ask you for the river name and the reach name, just like it would if you were creating a river reach in, in the geometric data editor. So I'm going to call this um, Eagle Creek. We're going to call it uh, downstream of the dam. So Ben, how many times have you uh, been clicking points and you've gone so fast that it thought you double clicked? <laughs> I've and, done that before, and I, in a minute <laughs> I'll show you a time. work. I'll show you a workaround of how you can uh, uh, resuscitate your your geometry if you do that. So um, once you press OK, that river reach is now named. Um, let's say, like Chris said, if you double clicked and this river reach is actually shorter than you wanted it to be, what you can do is you can always at any point click on the Edit Feature line double click on this line and you can add or move any of these vertices along your point. You can also re-click once this is selected and the vertices are displayed, you can re-click the add new feature and draw from the end of your line again, which is really, really helpful. Um, really so nice. I'm actually yeah. not going to do that, but that's, that's a really nice feature of, of HECRAS. So I'm going to go ahead and end that. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add my cross section data. And we'll come back to some of these other features in the river subsection, but for now, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to come into cross sections. Okay. And I'm going to edit my cross sections again. I'm going to add a new feature and I'm going to draw these cross sections in. I'm going to draw these from left to right, which is always good practice. And, uh, as you're drawing these, you can actually add dog legs in just like you would in the geometric data editor. If you know the direction of your flow, it's always good practice. All right, once I've drawn those 1D cross sections in, I'm gonna go ahead and click this edit feature button. Uh, so now we have our river center line and we have our cross section data. At this point, you could go ahead and um, extract data to these cross sections and, and run, a, run a 1D model that quick. 
However, there are a few other steps here in, in the uh, RAS Mapper editor that are really helpful and really, really good practice to do. So what I always do is after you've done drawn your cross sections, I come back into my river editor and I'm gonna add in bank lines, okay? So that's this under, under rivers, bank lines, I'm gonna add a new feature and then I'm gonna zoom in and I'm gonna add these bank lines right along the top of the bank, um, just like where we want them placed in, uh, in real life. And always, even in between the cross sections, make sure that the bank line is along the top of the bank because if you ever add any interpolated cross sections in between here and you wanna enforce those bank lines to those interpolated cross sections, it's good to have done the work ahead of time. So. Yeah, it's, import it's important to note, too, that you're never going to be perfect with this. You're always going to ne need to do some fine tuning back in the geometry window. But uh, this will at least get you really close. And, and that way, if you have a ton of cross sections, it's, it's much easier and quicker to fine tune than if you just started from scratch. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Chris said, you're always going to want to double check and refine where your bank stations are located within the cross section editor of the geometric data editor. But this is a really, really good first step and can save you a lot of time because a lot of times when you do this, you might go to make some edits to your bank stations and realize they're all in the right spot. and You won't need to do much. So it's a good yeah. time saver. Now I've drawn in my bank lines into my 1D reach. The next step I do is I'm going to draw in my flow paths and the flow paths are what calculate the reach lengths within your cross section. So right now, if we were to extract our elevation data to these cross sections, every cross section would have a downstream reach length in its channel, its left over bank and its right, right over bank based on the uh, channel length from this cross section to the next downstream cross section. You can see if we look at these two cross sections, the right over bank length should actually be a little bit less than the channel length. And likewise, the right over bank or the left over bank should be a little bit greater than the channel length. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my flow lines in. And when you're drawing in flow lines, what you want to imagine is uh, in a high flow scenario where your bank, your channel banks are being overtopped, where is flow going? It's going to be a little bit of an estimate, but um, Chris, I don't know if you have any suggestions as I'm drawing these for how well, you draw your flow lines in. Yeah, it, it's usually going to be a little bit straighter than the main channel. You know, you're not going to have as many meanders because in a high flow event, things are going to be kind of moving just straight down stream versus following meanders as much. I mean, it does a little bit. A lot of this is judgment. It's a very subjective exercise. But if you read in the manual, they do give you a little bit of a hint on where to place these. And they say it should be located at the center of mass of flow in the overbank, in the respective overbank. So where the heck is that? <laughs> Where's yeah, so the center might, of mass? But, you know, you actually can... You, this might ahead. actually take a few iterations then because you might need to run the model, see how far well, those flood extents are, and then adjust yeah. your flow lines based off that. That's right. What if the water doesn't ever even get out to where the, the flow line is you just drew? You probably mm -hmm. want to go back and redo it. But if it gets all the way out to the end point, mm -hmm. then that might be a pretty good location for the overbank. And fortunately, too, it's the results are not super sensitive because the conveyance out in the overbanks is typically pretty low. Most of the action that's happening is in the main channel. So, yeah. you know, estimate that center of mass. If you, this is what I tell people too, if you picture the overbank as sort of like a long extended triangle, then in theory, the center of mass should be about one third of the way over from the bank line to the end point of the cross section, mm -hmm. assuming water gets all the way out to the end point of the cross section. So. That's yeah, so me. Take, looks like that's about what you did in the leftover bank. Actually, I'm, I'm going to take your words of advice, Chris. I'm going to move some of these based on that and show people how I can do that. So again, I'm going to go to edit features. I'm going to double click on this flow line. I'm going to move these a little bit closer so that maybe they're a little bit closer to about one third of the way, um, like Chris was just describing. I think that's a good suggestion. So I'm going to move these in just a little bit. And again, I think this is a really good, another good example and uh, uh, another good defense for how every RAS project is going to be different and every you know, if you're doing a low flow model, these overbank lines shouldn't be here. They're probably going to be much closer to the channel. If you're doing a dam breach model and this dam is breaching, you might want to move these out. So it's very dependent yeah. on what you're doing, just like a lot of things in HECRAS. It's very, very project dependent. Uh, there's not a there's not a catch all solution. But that looks a little bit more like what Chris was talking about when it comes to the center of mass, assuming this is a fairly high flow model. Um, yeah. 
Cool. And, so, uh, what are the flow paths for? Did you? I don't remember if you mentioned that or not. But, yeah, um, I mentioned that they uh, they are for cal computing the downstream reach links and the uh, for the channel. It's computed based on the river, and then for the left and the right overbank, it's computed based on the flow lines. So. Yeah, and those reach lengths are going to be used to calculate the energy loss or the friction loss between cross sections. So it basically, multiplies the length that it extracts from that flow line by the friction slope that's calculated um using Manning's equation so um it, you know it's important that you get it right in the main channel um it's important in the overbanks but not quite as important it's not quite as sensitive nice cool yeah. all right so now that we have our 1d geometry all drawn in the next step is going to be extracting or computing the data for these cross sections and the way you do that is you select the cross section um, label here under geometries and you need to edit features and you'll go ahead and select all of these cross sections. If you only want to compute for a few of the cross sections, you can do that as well. But in this case, these are all new cross sections. So I'm going to select all the cross sections and then you can either right click here on, on any one of the cross sections, go to compute. And in this case, I'm going to uh, compute all cross section attributes. You can also do this by right clicking on uh, cross sections over here and compute all attributes if you want. And again, if you do this, if you have no cross sections highlighted and you just want to do it for an individual cross section, you can do that as well by right clicking, compute and doing this. So what this is going to do is it's going to uh, extract the river stations to each one of these cross sections based on the river center line as well as the flow lines. Uh, it's going to uh, extract the bank line point on the left and right bank to the cross section based on our bank lines that we drew. It's going to um, uh, compute the reach lengths and then finally the elevation profile based on the underlying terrain so one thing i like to always do before i compute here is just to double check and make sure that the terrain that we have is associated with this geometry so i'm going to go ahead and save our progress that we've made so you right click stop editing and make sure that you save your edits that's all saved now so i'm going to come down here to terrains you're going to right click on terrains and go to manage terrain associations and then you'll get a window that pops up that shows um, your geometry. So in this case, I have two different geometries. We're working with the demo draw here. And it's going to tell you which terrain is associated with this geometry. So in this case, it looks like I'm associating with the Bald Eagle Creek geometry, which is what I want. But let's say I wanted to, instead of associate with this terrain, I wanted to associate it with the just generic terrain that I have in here. You could drop this down, select that. And now that geometry is going to use the terrain terrain to extract the elevations as opposed to the bald eagle terrain. You also have the ability to assign if you have different Mannings and classifications, which again, we'll talk about on a later date. Um, you can choose which Mannings and shapefile you want to associate with a given geometry. So now that I know that my geometry is associated correctly, I'm going to come back into cross sections, edit the geometry. I'm going to go ahead and highlight all the cross sections, right click, compute, and compute all attributes, all of these below. Now, again, I wanna emphasize, there might be a situation where you already have an existing 1D model and you like where your bank stations are at, you're comfortable with the river stations and reach lengths. All you want to do is update the elevation based on the elevation profile based on the terrain. You can do that by just selecting this. But in this case, I'm gonna do all of the above, or I should say all of the below. And now these cross sections have uh, the correct data associated with them. And we can confirm this by, again, right clicking, stop editing, make sure we save our edits. And if I come back to the geometric data editor, again, if you guys aren't super familiar with RASMAPPER, I'm sure you're very familiar with this extent here. If I come into any of these cross sections, make sure I'm opening the right cross section layout here. So this is what I was just working with. You see our arrows indicating our cross sections are drawn left to right, thanks to Chris's uh, save there <laughs> earlier. <laughs> and if we come and click on any of these cross sections and view them in the edit cross section editor, what we'll see is these cross sections now have uh, a station elevation curve based on the underlying terrain. And we can we we can be sure that it's from the underlying terrain because we can turn if it's not already on, we can turn on this plot terrain feature and see that yep that lines up perfectly with the geometry of my cross section. We can see our bank stations are in relatively the right place. In this case, it looks like maybe we'd want to adjust this bank station slightly up 
Um, the easiest way to do that is, and this will be, I guess, the next step is once you are comfortable that the terrain has um, been associated with your cross sections correctly, you can come in here and inspect the bank station locations. That's always a good next step. The best place to do that is in the graphical cross section editor. We had a tutorial on this not too many episodes ago, so I'll just go over very quickly. But if you right click on, or if I should say, if you click on that option, you now, and then you uh, click on set bank stations, you can move this bank station location here to maybe somewhere where you think it's a little bit more, more appropriate. And you can do that for the rest of these cross sections. That one looks pretty good. That one looks pretty good. These all look pretty good. So it looks like just one little nice adjustment job, there man. that we had to make. I mean, you nailed it. And now just a reminder that if we come back into RAS Mapper and if we re, um, if we came in here and edited our cross sections and we highlighted all of our cross sections and computed and we computed all the attributes again, that change that we just made to the bank station would be undone. So that's really important just to remember if you make changes in the graphical cross section editor, that doesn't change the location of your bank lines within RAS Mapper. So uh, important note, and uh, you can check whether your uh, bank stations are based on the bank lines here or changes that you made in the graphical cross-section editor by turning on your bank stations here under your cross-sections. So if you go to cross-sections, expand that out, you have a couple different options here. Um, in this case, I'm going to look at my bank stations, and you'll see those bank stations show up as red dots. And for most all of these, it looks like it lines up more or less right along the bank station line, which it should have, except for this one right here, which is where I adjusted um, in the graphical cross-section editor. So that's just another really good check to make sure that everything's lining up, everything's looking good. There's a few other um, things in the cross-section editor um, that you have the options to view edge lines, which edge lines are simply lines that connect the ends of your cross-sections to each other. And these actually don't show up until you actually do a flow simulation. So these, you see, these won't actually show up right now. And same with the interpolated surface. This is going to show you uh, an approximation of where, if you were to interpolate between these cross sections, what the interpolated surface would be. And that's generated also after your initial run goes. Yeah, so, you have to run the computations first to see that, huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's kind of how you would build a simplified 1D model. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts or comments on that before we get into the 2D? Well, I think we ought to we ought to tell them a little bit about that river station marker layer under rivers because that, I could see that being very useful. Um, the one that's not checked there, yeah, you check that, and you can edit this. And basically, what this allows you to do is drop a point anywhere uh, along the the way and give it a specific river station. And when you do that, then RAS will actually use that river station override the river stationing it gets from the stream center line and interpolate in between those instead. And so this gives you control over the river stationing. And sometimes this is important if, say, the river, the actual river stationing that's used for, say, a specific project uh, does not actually match up with the river length. And a lot of times this happens. It's, it's certainly not uncommon to see where a certain project will have river stationing that they use, but that's it's not consistent at all with the stream center line length and so this is a way to override that yeah so you can you know obviously the old school way to change this would be to change this in the geometric data editor by changing the reach names and the reach tables but this is a little bit of a quicker way like chris just said if you right click on yeah. here edit you can create a new point at any one of these points so i'm going to do it on the upstream end in this case you can specify a river station so you'll see right now this is station 5000 if i make this station 6000 you'll see this change to 6000 but also all of these will be adjusted based on based on the established reach length. So if we click OK, looks like, oh, it looks like so my point was just a little bit downstream of that. So if you want to change the actual upstream cross section, you'll need to zoom in and make sure you're right on top of that cross section in order to get that to work. Yeah, really cool. good uh, overview, Ben. And I, I just want to encourage people to get used to RAS Mapper. I know if, if you've been used to using the geometry window, it might be a little bit unfamiliar and maybe a little bit confusing. It, Things happen differently in RAS Mapper than in the geometry window. You might right click in the geometry window and left click in, in the RAS Mapper, or vice versa, for the same thing. So just get used to that. The reason I want you to, to, to practice doing pre processing in RAS Mapper, though, is because this is ultimately the direction Heck RAS is going. So you'll eventually, in a future version, I think version six might be the one, but I'm not totally sure. But I think 
the geometry and RAS mapper will kind of blend into one window and it will act much more like RAS mapper than it will the old geometry window. So get used to that mm -hmm. and you'll be, uh, you'll be ahead of the game when the next when version 6.0 comes out. I will add to that as who knows who, when that will be. <laughs> I will add to that as somebody who uh, used ge the geometric data editor for just a little while and then got used to RAS mapper right away. Um, once you learn how to use it, you will never, ever, ever, ever go back because it is, it's much more user friendly. It's easier to navigate around. Um, it's easier to edit features that you've already finished. It's easier to make changes and not save them. Um, yeah. it's, it's just a lot more user friendly. So like Chris said, get used to it. Uh, yeah, there's, so a few, there's a few lim limitations real quick that I want to point out. And you okay. mentioned one already is you can't do structures yet in RAS mapper. You can't pre-process them. You can view them once they're in, but to put them in, you have to put them in the geometry window. So yep. that's still, uh, still required. Same thing with Manning's end for cross sections. If you want to get Manning's end values on the cross sections, you're going to have to do that in the geometry window. There's no way to extract from an, uh, an n value, sorry, an n value polygon layer, extract that on the cross sections. You can extract it onto a 2D area in RAS Mapper, but you can't extract it onto 1D Reach yet. But in 5.1, which hopefully will be coming out very soon, fingers crossed, uh, those things will be taken care of. Great and point. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that, Chris. So thanks for pointing that out. That's a really important detail about, um, you know, what you can't do in, in RAS Mapper. There's a lot you can do, uh, but you can't do everything. Um, all right. So the last topic for today is now that you guys know how to do a 1D reach is going to be drawing a 2D area in, in RAS. And drawing a 2D area is even easier than a 1D reach. There's even less to do. So hopefully this will be quick and Chris and I can spend some time talking about the intricacies of 2D areas and, and uh, some different ways to edit them here shortly. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, kind of pretend that we want a 1D reach drawn where I have it drawn right here. And then right around this junction, I'm gonna assume that we're gonna uh, want this to be drawn as a 2D area. Maybe we're gonna uh, anticipate some complex flow interactions here. And so we want a good representation of, of how the flow is gonna interact in this area. And so we're gonna draw it in 2D. Um, the way you do that is very similar to how you drew your 1D reach, but instead of editing the rivers, the cross sections, you're going to edit your 2D flow areas. So if we expand that out. Uh, the way you add a new 2D flow area is by right clicking on the perimeters, which is the perimeter of your 2D flow area. You're going to edit the geometry and then you're going to add a new feature. And in this case, uh, what I'm going to want to do is since I'm going to, I'm going to actually want to connect this 1D model to a to the 2D model downstream, I'm gonna make sure that my 2D boundary is right along the uh, 1D cross-section face here, as close as I can get it. Um, so yeah, once that's I have, a really good technique there. That's important to do it that way. Yeah, that's one of our many tips and tricks uh, for 1D, 2D connections that you'll get out of uh, the HECRAS 1D, 2D class if, anybody, if you guys ever have the chance to take that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and draw this out include kind of the area that I maybe anticipate seeing some, some flow uh, interactions occurring. And whenever you're drawing a 2D area, it's always better to err on the side of drawing too many cells, or I should say too large of a boundary than not a large enough boundary. Um, the cells that never get wet don't uh, require any computational time. And so there's really not a reason to not include them. The downside of including a boundary that or 2D area that's too small is if you have flow that butts up against the outside of your 2D area and you don't have a boundary condition associated with it, that flow won't have anywhere to go. So it'll pile up as if there's an imaginary wall here. So you always want to make sure that your 2D area uh, totally encompasses all of your results. So I'm going to be conservative and kind of assume that um, this is the outside of my boundary here. I'm going to end it just shortly downstream. Um, similar practice to a 1D cross section, I'm going to make sure that my end of my 2D area is perpendicular to the direction of flow. And then I'm gonna finish out this 2D area here. And again, just, just like the other features by double clicking, that is now complete. You're gonna give this a name. So I'm gonna call this junction because it's a junction of our main river stem and it looks like a tributary here. And now that you have your 2D mesh, now you'll notice that this doesn't have any cells in it right now, okay? And that's because it's just simply a perimeter. It has no computation points yet. In order to get computation points within this, you're gonna to have to right click on the perimeters. So this is always your next step you wanna do. Again, if you haven't done it yet, 
make sure that you are associated, your geometry is associated with the correct terrain that you want. Um, I already did that at the beginning of the 1D, so I know that's the case. I'm going to right click on junctions. I'm going to edit the 2D area properties. And that's going to pop up this uh, view tab here. It's going to tell me the 2D flow area I'm working with, and it's going to ask me to specify my center point spacing. In this case, I'm working in meters. And uh, you're almost going to always want to enter in uh, a square spacing, so you wouldn't want to do something with a rectangular. You can if you want, but it's always better to do a square. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and keep this at 100 for 100 now, and we'll see what it looks like. The only other thing that you have to edit before you actually compute these, um, these cell center spacing is make sure that you have your default Manning's N value that you want. So if you don't have an underlying Manning's N uh, layer that you're going to associate with this geometry and you just maybe want just a simplified approach, make sure that this is uh, the correct Manning's value that you're going to use. So in this case, I'm going to bump this up to just 0 0.07 considering how much of the floodplain we're encompassing and uh, we'll go from there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on generate computation points. It's going to do that. It's going to tell me how many points. So in this case, I have 58 cells. It's going to tell me some other information about those cells. It did that very quickly. And I'm just going to take a look at that. Now, to me, this doesn't look like the cells are nearly small enough to capture some of the detail that we want. So I'm going to actually bump this down to, let's say, 30, 30 meters by 30 meters. I'm going to click on generate computation points. It's going to ask me, hey, you already have computation points. Are you sure you want to override what you have? In this case, I'm going to say yes. And now we see something that looks a little bit more reasonable when it comes to the 2D areas. Okay. The next step, uh, once you have your 2D area drawn and your cell spacing established, is going to be to go in and edit your 2D area um, with break lines and refinement regions. So we're going to start with break lines here. Break lines are a really nifty feature that allow you to align your cell faces um, to high ground features or other features that you want them to be aligned to. So in this case, there's a couple high ground features that I'm going to want to capture. Looks like there's a high ground feature here. So I'm going to make sure that we have a break line that is kind of along this path here. And then I'm going to draw another break line at, it looks like there's some sort of highway or road that maybe comes up to a bridge here. Make sure you have a break line there as well. And then I'm going to make sure that we have break lines along. Actually, I'm going to add some refinement regions in here. So I'm going to leave that for now, and we'll talk about refinement regions in a second. So I have two break lines here that are kind of representing our cell faces. But you'll notice the cell faces aren't quite, a, quite aligned. They're, they're kind of skewed. And um, this is yeah, just kind of a... Uh, funny uh, how it distorts it like that, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I don't know exactly why that happens, but it's definitely not enforced yet. Yeah. Yeah. So in order to make sure that your cell faces are actually enforced, you need to highlight those break lines, right click, and enforce those break lines to your cells. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, and you'll see now my cells are all nicely aligned with our high ground feature. And this is important because let's say you have water that's coming down the tributary here, and it's in the floodplain, and it's moving along. If you have these cell faces aligned to the high ground, water's not going to be able to move from this cell to this cell unless it passes this elevation here. If before we had the break lines in, water could what we call leak from this cell to this cell because the cell was straddling that high ground feature. Um, so this is always a really important first thing to do is make sure you have your break lines in. Um, yeah, that's where the that's where the computations see the terrain. Computations see the terrain on the faces, not inside the cells, but on the faces. That's why it's so important to get the, those barriers to flow um, on the faces themselves. So nice, absolutely, yeah, and really then important. the next. The next thing that you might want to do is to add a refinement region in. And a refinement region, what that does is it adds um, more cells inside of a polygon, or I should say smaller cells inside of a polygon. And this is usually used if you want more detail within your channel or a specific area. So I'm going to show an example of this here. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my 1D reach. I'm going to assume that I want a pretty good amount of detail in this area within the channel, assuming that the channel is going to be conveying a lot of flow. So I'm going to draw, a, again, I'm just right clicking, or I should say left clicking, along the bank here, because I want to represent this channel area with some more cells to get some more detail. One other thing to note about the refinement regions is that the outside of the refinement region is actually a break line itself it's enforced just like a break line so i'm going to try to align the outside of this refinement region along high ground just like you would if you were 
drawing in a break line. That's something that people don't always know about refinement regions. Somebody yeah, you're allowed hand. to go outside your 2D area too, just like Ben did. So don't worry about extending beyond. In fact, it's better to do that than to be a little bit short. Yep. So uh, what I'm going to do now is so so you can see it's drawn in. It's not enforced yet. We don't have any smaller cells in here yet. You can see some of the the break line skew on the outside of it happening. And what I'm going to what I want is it's a good rule of thumb to always have five to seven cells across your river channel. So I'm going to measure this river channel. It looks like to me that it's about 46 meters wide. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and assume that I want seven cells, which would mean that we'll go ahead and make these. Um, cells inside of the refinement region, um, seven meters by seven meters, and that should give us the cell spacing that we want inside of this refinement region. So by spec to specify the cell spacing within the refinement region, you just right click, edit the refinement region properties, and we're gonna put in our cell size to be seven meters by seven meters. You also have these options, which are the exact same options you have with your break lines, that will edit the space, cell center spacing along the outside of your refinement region in this case, or along your break line if you're if you're editing the break line. The perimeter spacing specifies the cell spacing right along the perimeter. The repeat, the near repeat specify the number of times that you want that perimeter spacing to be enforced as you move away from the break line. And then the far spacing is once you end the near repeats or once you get away from the perimeter spacing, what do you want that next cell spacing to be? Um, and this can be helpful if you're trying to, for instance, what we'll see here is if I select this refinement region and I enforce a cell size of seven by seven, you can see that uh, there's quite a bit of difference between this and what we have out in the in the floodplain itself. You can also see that we have some issues here with the break line in the middle here. And that's because our break line is um, is enforcing a cell size that is equal to the default cell size out here, so 30 meters by 30 meters. So if I want to fix this issue in here, what I can do is I can either remove the break line so it's outside of the channel, or I can come in, right click on edit break lines. I can change the near spacing to seven meters to match, um, to match the refinement region, okay? And if I enforce that, you can see that we now have a nice seven uh, meter spacing along this break line. And if I wanna fix what's inside the refinement region, I can just come back here, right click on refinement regions, reinforce this, and you should see that all oh, we have a nice cell spacing in here now, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, Chris, what do you notice right away when I did that? Uh, something that should jump out to you. Yeah, that red dot, the, the dreaded red dot, meaning you got more than eight sides. And this is so common when you're doing uh, break lines or refinement regions where you are going from rather coarse cells to very refined cells. So if you transition over too great a distance or too great an amount, so for example, we're going from seven to 30, that's a pretty good jump. You're risking getting these cells, but there are ways to fix that. And that's what uh, those near repeats and, and uh, perimeter spacing and that kind of stuff is there for to help you kind of transition better. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the other way you can do this is if you just want to come in and right click on computation points under your 2D flow areas, add a feature, and you can simply just zoom in here and add another point. And if you right click, stop editing, save, you should see, oh, we still have more than eight sides. So yeah, we're gonna- Yeah, to sometimes it takes more. a few of those, yeah. So we're gonna add some more points in here. It looks like it jumped over here now. But now we got rid of that error, so we're good to go um, if we wanted to run this. Before, if we tried to run this in the simulation, uh, it, w it would not work. It would give us an error because of that too many too many faces um, along so, it. So, Ben, let's go back real quick because I want to show, show folks something. Um, can you change your break line back to the nominal 2D area spacing? So just sure, remove thanks. that seven and enforce it. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, redo the refinement region. Yep. Like you did before, just go ahead and reinforce it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is where you pointed out that it looks a little funny right there on the break line. Now, if you can right click on the break line again, I want to see if this will work. So I'm kind of risking this not working, which is always a bad thing on a uh, podcast recording, but we'll see if this works. If you go to edit, 
and then uncheck the enforce one cell protection radius for that one. Mm -hmm. Now go back to the refinement region and reinforce that and see what happens. I'm crossing my fingers that this works. Oh, all right, it did. Shock a pow. Yeah, so that's what that enforce one cell protection radius is for, is it will protect the cells along that break line even when you have an overlap or you've got some other feature like a refinement region or another break line that's too close to it. So mm -hmm. that's another way to, to take care of that problem. Very nice. Good, good point, Chris. Last thing I'll add about uh, to editing 2D geometry is the refinement regions can be used to get some, you know, computational differences. Again, for this, in this instance, I wanted some more detail in my one in my river reach here, and I didn't need as much detail out in the floodplain. Another reason that refinement regions are often used is if, for like restoration design projects. So for instance, maybe along this tributary here, uh, we're proposing to put in a couple of rit wads or stream bars. What you can do is you can add a refinement region, add a new feature, zoom into where that design is going to be taking place. And you can actually draw in, for instance, like let's say we're going to put in a rit wad here. And we'll call that rit wad number one. We're going to put another one in. This one will be a little bit bigger here and then maybe we have a couple uh something like stream barbs that we want to that we want to stimulate so i'm going to put a couple barbs out here in the stream do another one let's say here now once we have these in here i'm going to i'm going to change the cell spacing to so i can get a little bit of representation of how the flow would move around these individual things. So if I right click on this refinement region, I'm gonna make these cells pretty small um, so we get some good detail. I'm gonna make these, let's say uh, two meters each. I'm gonna highlight them both at the same time. And I'm gonna go ahead and enforce those. So now we can see, oh wow, we got some really good uh, detail within these rit wads. I'm gonna do the same thing with our stream barbs. I'm gonna right click edit the property. I'm going to change the near spacing here to something similar. Let's do three meters for both of these. I'm going to highlight both of my stream barbs and enforce those. Okay. You can see that we got some nice cell alignment there. Looks like we have a couple more errors. So I'm going to fix those with adding some more computation points. Okay. Now we have a really nice um, kind of stratification of detail. Again, most of our floodplain, we are okay with having larger cells, but we want some more detail in either the cell channel here, or maybe if we're doing a restoration design inside of this, the stream barb or rit wad, um, we can, we can kind of capture the flow behavior a little bit better in those areas. Um, yeah. And then yeah, very good. the other thing you can do that we'll touch on next time is to uh, add many override regions, which would specify the manning values inside of maybe these rit wads or stream barbs, or if you had a different manning's value inside of this channel. Um, but we'll have a discussion on manning's values in an upcoming podcast, and we'll cover all of that and more. Um, Chris, do you have anything else that you want to add to this kind of tutorial on building 1D and 2D models within RASMAPPER? No, you did a great job. That's a really good overview. Uh, feel free to watch this multiple times because we covered a lot in a, a fairly brief amount of time. But hopefully this gives you the confidence to start doing some pre-processing in RAS Mapper. And of course, it's required um, for certain elements of 2D modeling, example being the refinement regions. You cannot do that in the geometry window. You have to do that in RAS Mapper. So I um, encourage you guys to, to give that a try. And um, yeah, hopefully this helps out a lot. So thanks for that, Ben. Absolutely. Yeah, this is this was great. Um, again, we'll have another one of these coming out where we talk about Manning's values and then another one where we talk about viewing results in RASMAPPER, which will be super helpful. I'm very excited about that. Right. We'll, we'll get a lot of good stuff out of that. Um, and again, just want to encourage you guys, if you're getting a lot out of these videos, keep an eye out for the next class because we're going to have another 1D, 2D online class. We're having great success with this one, and we'd love for you guys to be part of that with us. So keep an eye out. Um, for that. And uh, anything else, Chris, before we sign off? Check out uh, the RAS Solution. Check out uh, our other podcasts. Uh, we're building a good collection there. Hopefully those will be very helpful. And, uh, and just keep practicing. Yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks All for right, tuning sounds, in. Sounds good, everybody. Stay safe out there. Uh, this has been Full Momentum, an HEC RAS podcast.